will be a very happy event for me if I can be the means of introducing Abraham Lincoln to a few, whose hearts I know beat in true unison with the ideals of Lincoln, ideals the advancement of which made him immortal. With the extension of these ideals, there will undoubtedly be a better world. Hundreds gathered at the Redlands Bowl on February 12, 1932, to dedicate the newest jewel in Redlands, the Lincoln Memorial Shrine. Ninety years have come and gone since that momentous occasion, the genesis of an enduring legacy for Redlands. But familiar questions continue to be asked by first-time visitors. What is a Lincoln Shrine? Why is it in Redlands? Who are the people behind its creation? That story began more than 150 years ago in the East Midlands of England. I was born in the early morning of April the 5th, 1858, in the second cottage from Derby Road of a row of small dwellings known as Bacon's Yard, Alfreton, Derbyshire, England. During the Industrial Revolution of the late 18th and 19th centuries, Derbyshire became a center for cotton mills, limestone, quarrying, lead mining, and coal mining. Alfreton, along the eastern edge of Derbyshire, was situated in a coal mining area. Robert's parents were John and Alicia Watchhorn, John toiled at the local colliery, or coal mine, in order to make a living. But a carefree childhood was not to be young Bobby's future. The school days and the pranks, tussles, special events, and all their impressive effects came to an abrupt end early in April 1869, just at the commencement of my 11th year. At that time, there were six other children in our family. My father was a coal miner, whose wages were not enough to produce affluence, falling short of providing ordinary comforts for the family. Therefore, when I volunteered to help out, the offer was accepted, though with painful reluctance by my mother. The work was grueling and dirty. Twelve-hour days were common, and his meager earnings were given over to his mother to help support the family. Although he didn't realize it then, this formative period in his life forged a determination and resolve that would benefit him the rest of his life. He later recalled about working in the mines that self-emancipation became a ruling passion, resulting in the determination never for a moment to relax the purpose to be free at the first opportunity from an occupation so terribly depressing, so fraught with perils and so lamentable, unremunerative. Robert continued his education at night following work in the mines during the day. When he turned 22, he, like so many others, decided to look for a better life and more opportunity in the United States. In May 1880, he disembarked at Castle Garden, New York, beginning this new chapter of his life. Soon, he found himself in the coal mines of Pennsylvania. He became involved with the labor movement, looking to improve conditions and wages for miners. When the United Mine Workers of America organized in 1890, he was elected its first secretary. This work brought him from Pennsylvania to Ohio. I learned to love Ohio. Best of all, it was where I met my future wife, the dearest and most delightful of companions. For all of these years, she has been the apple of my eye, the very essence of my endeavors, the consummation of my achievements, the sharer of my disappointments, the helper of helpers, and the sweetest of mothers to our children, Robert and Dewitt. Alma Jessica Simpson was working as a teacher when the two met, and they married in 1891. Their first child, Robert Kinnear Watchhorn, was born the following year, but sadly passed away in 1893. In 1895, they welcomed their second son, Ewart. Robert Watchhorn's career path took him from the United Mine Workers to an appointment as factory inspector for the state of Pennsylvania and then to the Immigration Service of the United States. He began as an immigration inspector at Ellis Island, then was appointed supervising inspector general, a position that involved traveling across the country and the world. His continuing success resulted in a promotion as commissioner of immigration for the entire border with Canada in 1903, and ultimately an appointment by President Theodore Roosevelt. On February the 5th, 1905, I took the oath of office as Commissioner of Immigration at the Port of New York. 
the headquarters of which were at Ellis Island. This island was located on the New Jersey side of the bay, a mile or two from Old Castle Garden at the south end of Manhattan Island, where I had myself landed as an immigrant steerage passenger 25 years previously. During his tenure as commissioner, Watchhorn oversaw the largest annual influx of immigrants from Europe, with more than one million passing through its halls in 1907 alone. Because he was himself an immigrant, he held a compassionate position towards those seeking a better life in America. With the transition to the Taft administration in 1909, Watchhorn looked for other opportunities. An offer of employment as treasurer of the Union Oil Company presented itself, and he jumped at the chance. The Watchhorns moved 3,000 miles west to Los Angeles. Ewart graduated from Hollywood High School in 1914, a popular and successful student with an artistic streak. He even worked for noted Pasadena architect Elmer Gray. However, world events soon impacted the lives of millions of people. When America entered the war on the side of the Allies, Ewart was among the very first to enlist. At 21 years old, Ewart joined the nascent U.S. Army Air Service, training to be a pilot. He served in Italy, flying Italian Caproni bombers on dangerous bombing raids across the Italian Alps. The squadron was led by Fiorella LaGuardia, whom Watchhorn had hired as an Italian interpreter at Ellis Island more than a decade earlier. While serving in Italy, Ewart suffered health issues, but returned to the United States triumphant after the war. By this time, Watchhorn had left Union Oil and founded his own company, Watchhorn Oil & Gas, headquartered in Oklahoma City. The company successfully struck oil and Ewart joined his father in the oil business. Tragically, Ewart was struck with a mystery illness in May 1921 and succumbed to septicemia two months later in July at age 25. Robert and Alma Watchhorn were grief-stricken, but resolved that something good must come from this heartbreak. I preferred to dispose of my participating share in Ewart's estate by memorializing his name whenever a suitable opportunity presented itself. It has helped me to present a beautiful park to my native town, Alfreton, Derbyshire, England, in honor of his mother, and to erect a Methodist church and adjacent structures adjoining the park in memory of his grandmother, my mother, whom he never knew. In his grief, Watchhorn recalled a conversation he shared with Ewart while visiting England before the war. Dad, I think the reason the English people have such a limited respect for America and Americans is due to the fact that they are kept in ignorance of the actual America. I think, from my contact with them, that they are mostly of the Abraham Lincoln type. And if they could be made acquainted with the big outstanding fact that the kind-hearted, pure-minded Lincoln is America's greatest hero, all England would come to love Lincoln too. And loving him, they could not fail to appreciate America also. My son's remark makes an appeal to me to do whatever I can to make folk better acquainted with the incomparably modest, unostentatious and immortal Abraham Lincoln. Watchhorn's first major acquisition was an impressive bust of Abraham Lincoln in 1922, carved from Carrara marble by noted sculptor George Gray Barnard. The majesty of this masterpiece of sculpting cannot be told in words. As one gazes on that calm face, the features so faithfully reproduced by the artist, he takes on some of the dignity and purpose of the subject. Watchhorn's interest in Lincoln continued to grow. In the 1920s, he decided to build a library dedicated to Abraham Lincoln and Alfreton to help fulfill Ewart's belief about the understanding of Lincoln and America in England. During the same period, the Watchhorns settled in Redlands for their winter residence, still maintaining a home in Dutchess County, New York. In Redlands, they demonstrated their philanthropic spirit by a gift of chimes to the First Methodist Church of Redlands in Ewart's name. But the Barnard bust of Lincoln burned in Watchhorn's mind, and the idea of giving it to the people of Redlands sprung forth. It is my hope that I may do something in the name of our son to make folks better acquainted with the sturdy, big, warm-hearted man and towering statesman, Abraham Lincoln. Conversations abounded between the Watchhorns and friends on Smiley Library's Board of Trustees about adding a wing to the library for the bust. 
Then, in 1931, those discussions determined that a separate standalone building was a more suitable and appropriate opportunity. The Lincoln Memorial Committee, a who's who of Redlands, selected Elmer Gray, for whom Ewart had worked nearly 15 years earlier as architect. This new form would be a place to come and quietly contemplate Lincoln, a Lincoln Shrine. On February 12, 1932, their dream became a reality with the dedication of the Lincoln Memorial Shrine, a gift to Redlands, given during the depths of the Great Depression. Thousands turned out for the ceremony held at the Redlands Bowl. I have no speech. My speech is over there, and it will stand for other generations to be inspired by the example of the great American who turned the currents of freedom into the souls of millions of fellow men. From that day to this, the Lincoln Memorial Shrine has grown to be the preeminent institution honoring Abraham Lincoln and the American Civil War west of the Mississippi River. More than a million visitors have come to learn and reflect on Lincoln and this pivotal moment in the nation's history. Today, the Shrine continues to fulfill Robert Watchhorn's vision. Personally, I feel so strongly that the influence of Abraham Lincoln is powerful enough to help the whole world. Let us do our best, that when we look in the mirror, we can know what sort of person we see. Keep out in the open field and work for the best that is within you. Mm -hmm.